Hello colleagues, welcome to our COVID-19 ECHO series, session number 51. My name is Francis Ochen from the African Society for Laboratory Medicine, uh, your session moderator today. In today's session, we take a look at external quality assessment for SARS-CoV-2 and other emerging viruses. This session will run for one hour. We will take a presentation and get to the question and answer. Answer sessions. Please join the discussion services. Please keep to one of the channels, either English or French, depending on which one you're most suitable with. Uh, we also note that today's presenters have capacity to deal with both languages and some of the questions may be answered directly in French. So you're better off keeping to one of the two channels. We know that EQA provides objective evidence for a laboratory's credibility of reporting valid test results. And it is therefore a vital tool for monitoring laboratory performance. However, conditions for implementing EQA can vary depending on the location and may face specific challenges in resource limited settings. In this session, therefore, we will cover experiences from the European CDC EQA for SARS-CoV-2 detection and variant typing among European reference laboratories. We'll also look at the experiences for the EQAs for emerging viruses in resource limited setting, and then wind it up with looking at challenges in general management, but specifically preparing EQAs suitable for tropical countries. And so to go through all this, we have two speakers. Our lead speaker today will be Professor Jean Felix Drexler. Professor is a medical doctor and an associate professor and head of the Virus Epidemiology Laboratory at the Institute for Virology of the Charit University and Teaching Hospital in Berlin, Germany. His work focuses on epidemiology and evolutionary biology of emerging viruses. His major achievements include uh, the development of affordable HIV test kits, hepatitis C and yellow fever viruses kits, the uncovering of zoonotic origin of major human viruses, including mums, hepatitis A and hepatitis B viruses and also elucidation of key aspects of the epidemiology of the Latin American Zika virus outbreak. Professor Drexler will be supported by Carlo Fischer. Carlo is a biologist and a research associate at the Institute of Virology of the same university where Professor Drexler uh, works. Uh, Fisher's work focuses on the diagnostic and epidemiology of emerging viral diseases, including also the conduct of external quality assessment for Zika virus and SARS-CoV-2. Colleagues, join me in welcoming the two gentlemen, uh, starting with Professor Drexler. Professor, over to you to take us through the first segment of our presentation. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, everyone, uh, for being part of today's session. It's a pleasure to be here. I extend my warmest greetings and, and, uh, and, and my thanks to the African Society of Laboratory Medicine and the German Gesellschaft für, für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, the GIZ, um, the German Development uh, Corporation that has facilitated my participation in today's event. And I'm very happy to share with you uh, an expert audience of mixed background and mixed motivation. Um, some of our work into external quality assurance, as Francis said, with a focus on resource limited settings today. And I'm looking forward to, uh, the, to the discussion with uh, the colleagues in the call today. Um, having said that, let me go straight to the slides. So this is all about uh, our, our experience in external quality assurance. And uh, I would like to start with something that is more than known to you. 
the laboratory responsibles in, 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 in African countries. The infrastructure, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, is weaker than in other regions of the world. To the left, you see, this is relatively old data. Do not worry, the picture has not changed dramatically. It's the tests, the COVID-19 tests run per 1,000 people in different regions of the world, and Sub-Saharan Africa stands uh, lowest of, all, of different regions globally. The same applies to other, it's not just laboratory infrastructure, the same applies to physicians and hospital beds, where also Sub-Saharan Africa is at the, at the lowest um, position of, uh, of different world regions. And all of this leads to an overload of diagnostic laboratories. There are in many countries, there are fewer reference laboratories that are very well trained, have well trained personnel, are well equipped, but they get a lot of testing demand. This is an example from our work we do with um, your colleague and our colleague, Angia Douton in Benin, you see the country here in Western Africa. And this is the onset of the pandemic in his lab. This is the reference lab for viral hemorrhagic fevers in Benin. And um, you see that this is about what they can process per day, hundreds of samples. And in many occasions, they got requests for several hundreds. There were days that ca came with several thousand samples per day to be processed immediately. And the lab has dealt with this in establishing night shifts and using all their available personnel for COVID-19 testing at the expense, of course, of routine diagnostics, hemorrhagic fevers, which is far from unimportant, of course, in a, in a West African setting. And this is a picture that I'm very sure most, if not all of you who are from the lab side in the talk today share. There is also, uh, we should also keep in mind that COVID-19 testing in, 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 in Africa as everywhere on the planet is not an easy task. The genetic diversity of the virus is very high. Follow me to the right of this slide first. This is also data we generated with Angia Douton in Benin and published this a few months ago. This is different lineages of SARS-CoV-2, including the alpha, the delta, beta, and alpha variants of concern. And you see they all co-occur in Benin. To the right, you see time. So this is just detection over time and, se and, and sequencing-based results that Ange generated. And you see, uh, this is very interesting because you see that Delta, you see, we were able to monitor the takeover of Delta in a West African prototyping setting. In May, 3% of all of the specimens sent to the National Reference Lab in Benin were Delta. And by mid-July, it was 60% of all positive specimens. And this is the peak you see here. This is just reported cases from the Beninese Ministry of Health um, to the WHO, and you see this is the delta wave. And the number of reported cases coincides perfectly with the increase of delta. So the lab data perfectly matched uh, what was followed by the third large, by the largest then and the third wave of uh, COVID-19 in Benin. It's also important to remember that companies from affluent settings who develop tests for COVID-19 testing, PCR or antibody tests, rarely, if ever, validate their tests for use in an African setting. And people differ. They differ in the immune background they have, in nutrition type, in, in genetics, in co-infections, and, and, and so on and so on. And these tests must be validated, but they rarely are. And this is an early example that we also published with Ange Yadouton from Benin, where we showed that an, an antibody ELISA to test IgG antibodies against SARS coronavirus 2. In Sierra from 2019, when SARS CoV 2 was not a human virus, it did not exist in humans, were clearly positive. I've boxed them here in red. And this is an ELISA, so this is ELISA reactivity. There's none of those samples, you see that here in a highly specific plaque reduction neutralize, neutralization test, so an NT. They have no titer. Those are not SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, but they make a clear positive signal in an antibody ELISA. And that's a huge problem for anything, for to assess past exposure, to make zero prevalence studies, to make any estimates on the true burden of COVID-19 in Africa. And we tried to investigate why this was happening. 
and we found uh, that this could be linked to malaria, to acute malaria. Here you see that between the, on, on the bottom of those bars, you see SARS-CoV-2 ELISA positive and negative specimens. The proportion uh, as a, uh, uh, to the fraction of parasitemic, so those that had malaria uh, parasites in the blood at the time of testing, and there is a difference clearly. It was not statistically significant, but the parasite loads were higher, significantly higher, in the false positive in those sera giving false positive ELISA results than in the negative ELISA negative sera, hinting at and uh, at malaria as the cause of unspecific reactivity, whether this is acute malaria or just an antibody response remains to be determined. But I've plotted here another interesting paper that came out a few months after our paper from uh, US colleagues. And they showed that this was correlated to antibody response against some, but not all plasmodium antigens. So here you see five plasmodium antigens here and the antibody levels against those five in the ELISA false positive, the same finding as us using pre-pandemic CIRA from Nigeria. And again, for higher antibody levels, IgG antibody levels against those five malaria, or sorry, plasmodium antigens in false positive CIRA, hinting at something that could be cross recognition of glycan structures uh, between plasmodia, parasites, and sars cov two, and potentially other viruses. In that paper, we also showed that those sera that gave unspecific ELISA reactivity for SARS-CoV-2 were also more likely to give unspecific reactivity in a Zika virus ELISA. So it's probably not limited to just SARS-CoV-2. It's something very generic happening here. And since so many people in African settings have malaria, the validity of any antibody study should be thoroughly evaluated. And I'm highlighting this to say that testing and test assurance is of utmost importance in African settings. Of course, it's not just important in African settings, it's also important in European setting. I work in Germany in the biggest university hospital of Germany, one of the biggest of Europe. And uh, this is a slide that Carlo, who is the co-host of today's talk from my team and I have put up. Uh, it reports the EQA performance from a past European program that was called ENIFD, N-I-V-D. The program no longer exists. It has been replaced by a follow-up program that is called EVD LabNet. It's just the acronym uh, of that project that runs EQAs for the ECDC, the European Centre for Disease Control. And this is summing up 15 years of work of that EU program, that EU project. PCR EQAs, serology EQAs, and what the program classified as good results. This is percent. Just follow me here how variable the dots are. Both for PCR and serology, you can have, they had EQAs for some viruses. I don't care, this is different viruses, of course. 25% um, to more than 75% of good results between the labs. This, and this, those are the best laboratories of European countries. It's the reference laboratories of those countries in most cases. So this, I think, illustrates quite nicely that um, we can always get better, we can always improve, and we need to know how well we do. And the, the key to do this is participation in external quality programs, such as in Europe. And uh, in the following, we have done three EQAs ourselves. Um, we have done a Zika virus EQA in Brazil in 2018 shortly after the peak of the Zika outbreak in Latin America. And together with the Dutch Public Health Institute, RIVM, and uh, Dr. Chantal Reusken, our close collaborator, we have uh, performed um, two EQAs for SARS-CoV-2. One of that is published. I will show you the data. One of that is unpublished. We're just trying to write up a manuscript. I will also show you the data. So first, the Zika uh, EQA. We were able to uh, work with 15 Brazilian expert labs. And we did the first and up to now only EQA uh, Brazil, from Brazil for Zika virus. This is a PCR EQA. Remember, Brazil was the hotspot of microcephaly cases linked to Zika in, during the 2014 to 16 outbreak of Zika. So if the bar goes to the top, it shows perfect performance, it goes to 12 points, it's just some scoring system that Carlo has implemented, Carlo Fischer from my team, he's in the talk and he's, 
here to, to also take your questions on the technical aspects. So don't uh, fall short of having technical questions later on. He's, uh, he's happy to reply in the chat or, or live. So we have uh, labs that scored perfectly. And then to the down, to the bottom of this, we have wrong results. In cyan, you have false positive PCR results. And in red, you have false negatives. False negatives in Zika can always occur. The Zika virus load is very low. It's much lower than an HIV load that many of you know probably from HIV testing. So the mean or median load of a Zika virus infected patient is 10 to the four copies per mil. That's not a lot. It's about, it depends on how much blood you use for extraction. It's where you come to the technical limit of any molecular system like PCR or DD-PCR, it doesn't matter. It's, this is where you, you can't get better unless you extract from more blood and concentrate the allure. So false negatives are not worrying. False positives are worrying. Remember, Zika virus was associated with microcephaly, severe congenital malformations. So giving a false result as illustrated by this EQA, the possibility of this illustrated by this EQA to a patient has very dramatic consequences. We know that in all of Latin America, requests for abortion have increased by over 100% in almost all countries during the Zika outbreak. Mothers were afraid to give birth to a malformed baby and they preferred to abort, which per se is already an issue that can be debated. But remember that Latin American countries are most, mostly Catholic and, uh, and in consequence, um, or partly in consequence, abortion is considered illegal. It's not considered illegal, it is illegal. So this drives women in men if they are not rich enough to pay a gynecologist, a proper gynecologist to perform the illegal abortion, at least under proper circumstances. It drives them to very, very scarce settings that uh, will ultimately increase dramatically the chances of infection and of death of both the fetus and the mother. And this has happened far too often to ignore what can be uh, the results of a false positive test result. So I, I think this nicely illustrates why we shouldn't treat today's topic as something that is just for nerds, lab nerds, or a boring topic that you have to engage in if you are a lab person. It illustrates the, the impact you can get as a lab from this you, to do your job properly. Now to SARS, COVID-19. Uh, this is the participant countries of the first EQA that we performed. It shows you basically a map of Europe and they all participated. I mean, with very few exceptions. 30, 40, 50 labs, I don't remember, many. This is the results. Again, it's a scoring system. And to the top, you have perfect scoring. So those labs here, every bar is one laboratory from one country. And to the bottom, again, just as in the Zika, pay, uh, Zika study, you see the false negatives in, well, what is that? Uh, some, some shade of purple. And in a darker shade, the false positives. So this, again, looks a bit like the Zika PCR EQA. We have false negatives. Okay, concentrations, sometimes we send them out in very low concentrations because we want to peak labs to, to see if they are sensitive. Um, and then the false positives, of course, is a different issue. First, let me go straight to, to the weekly concentrated specimens. On the Y scale, you have the CT value. So high CT values mean, um, uh, mean um, little virus. So of course, when you have little virus in the tube that is send it blind, blinded to the labs, they have more negatives. Of course they do. And of course, if you send a lot of virus, here you have the genome copies on the Y scale below the box plot. So this is a thousand fold more copies than the left box plot. Um, of course, you have just very few negatives. That's expected. And this is the second EQA that we sent out just a few months ago. Again, it shows you a lab of Europe and participating labs. And this is unpublished. You cannot read it yet. Um, um, but what is good is that it's, it's mostly the same labs as in the first EQA and the proportion of correct samples increased quite, quite a lot from 90% complete correct samples to 96. That's, it may seem marginally to some of you, but that's quite an improvement. Here again, you see the same re result. Again, we had false results, we had inconclusive results, but we really focused on sending out weekly concentrated specimens. So that's quite an improvement and it shows the value of repeating EQAs. 
Importantly, in the second EQA, um, we had um, typing. So we wanted the labs to, um, to analyze the strain of SARS-CoV-2 in the tube. We have tubes with very weak virus concentrations, 2.5 copies per microliter, and about a uh, hundredfold more, and different variants. This is just an example of the alpha variant, but it shows you how the typing success, correct typing here in, say, some kind of green color, increased quite a bit from 40% in a weekly concentrated specimen, so most labs did not type correctly or were not able to type correctly in that specimen to over 60% typing correctly. And that is, uh, I think, quite quite nice because it shows how difficult it can be to type weekly concentrated specimens, which of course is of utmost public health importance. And how do, and, and this is a nice piece of data showing how those labs typed. So, um, so we separated the typing by method. You have labs just doing SNPs, so single nucleotide variants by qPCR, so just to have a PCR-based typing result, maybe a melting curve-based, maybe a probe-based system, and you have uh, high throughput sequencing, Illumina, whatever method is employed, and you have the labs combining qPCR and high throughput sequencing. On the Y scale, you have the samples that were exactly identified, and as you can see, the high throughput sequencing, maybe it's not a surprise, it's laborious, it's time-consuming, Expensive, extremely much more expensive than just a PCR, but it's much more accurate. Importantly, the combination of both methods provides a, a much higher success a proportion of successfully typed specimens than just qPCR or just high throughput sequencing at all. So this is a nice piece of data, I think, that tells lab how to how to how we can move forward if we want to, to type the viruses, the COVID-19 strains, the hot COVID-2 strains. Now, in the second portion of the talk, I will talk less about data and more about the experience of how does one prepare an EQA panel, which we have done repeatedly. Carlo has spent months and months and months in the lab preparing a panel for the European reference labs. And let's look at how this has gone. Um, this is a, a citation from a paper on neglected tropical diseases. And that paper says 90% of the labs had good skills but almost all of them lacked external verification measures. So they were not able to know how well they were doing. And that's of course a problem. And part, I guess one reason of why they don't have access is because few people provide this because it's challenging to, pro to produce this. First challenge, SARS-CoV-2 and some comparator viruses are considered in our, in our setting, for example, a biosafety level three pathogen. So it means, this is Carlo, working in our BSL-3 uh, with a negative pressure in the room, with positive pressure in his respiratory hood. So uh, uh, this, of course, complicates the production growing such a virus. And uh, you have, of course, have to inactivate the sample before you send it around. Again, you need a high security, a high containment laboratory to do this. Not everybody has this. It's extremely expensive and not all countries can afford this. Another challenge that may seem trivial to you, but trust me, it can be quite a challenge. It's worth your, your time and your thoughts. What tubes do you use for your QA? There is plastic tubes, there is glass tubes, they can have a metal opening. You wouldn't believe how many people cut their fingers in the lab when opening this and then complain to the QA provider that they have been injured. It's not a trivial task to, to select the, the best suited um, um, tubes and not all of them are always available. So that's uh, a, a small piece of data. You don't read in textbooks easily. Then you have shipping. Shipping can be an absolute nightmare. Some of you may know that from personal experiments. There's country specific requirements on a donation declaration. You send something that has no commercial value, but you have to convince each country's custom service of that so that the lab can receive it. It's not an easy task and it's not easy for them to receive it. It's not easy for us to produce this. Each country has individually different uh, requirements on what, how such a declaration should be made and it's not easy. Some countries won't tell you what you have to write so that the shipment goes through. And of course, it's easy to say this has no commercial value. It's not to be sold. I'm providing this free of charge. I, I am as a university 
provider, as a scientific uh, colleague. Of course, so there's companies who sell it. I'm not a company. I'm not. I've ne we've never sold any of this, and we won't ever. And then, of course, you have restrictions of importations. I can give you a strong example from France, uh, a very affluent European setting that is prohibited to receive SARS coronavirus one. So the virus that caused the epidemic in 2003, 2004 in China and Canada mostly. And of course, it's a nice comparator virus and we were not able to send this to France, but it was part of our panel. So we had to take those tubes out of the shipments we sent to France. So all of this causes delays during shipment and at customs that have to be taken into account. Sometimes a panel will stay for six, eight weeks stuck before it reaches the lab. And this is a problem because in most countries you work in, the temperature is very high and uh, RNA or virus will degrade. And how will you be able to measure that lab's performance in that setting? And the reply is, uh, you have to lyophilize. You have to freeze dry specimens. And that comes with an additional, for resource limited settings. In affluent settings, I know you can ship on dry ice. Uh, it's more expensive, it's complicated, it's a dangerous good. So not all planes and couriers will take it. It increases the shipping cost from maybe $20 or euros per package to sometimes 2000. It depends on what and where you ship, but it, it can be a solution. But lyophilization circumvents this. The problem with lyophilization freeze drying is it's not trivial to do this technically. You're gonna blow out like in this example, a lyophilized, a lyophilization machine totally filled with biological material. This is not what you want to have. So this will, immediately to severe cleaning because it will of course contaminate it's not just biosecurity it's also contamination of specimens that will lead to false results when you lyophilize you also have to invest your time and your energy and your thought into the sample matrix do you in what liquid do you lyophilize the virus in email so cell culture medium or in in pbs do you use a biological matrix? Do you use respiratory material? Or with Zika, do you use plasma or serum? It's not a trivial uh, uh, reply because um, in what you resuspend or your virus, or, well, not resuspend, in what you place your virus um, will affect the speed of lyophilization and the stability of RNA dramatically. So this all is not trivial and you cannot give a an easy recommendation because it will differ from EQA to EQA. Then lyophilization causes RNA loss in general. And this is trivial, maybe yes, you freeze dry it, you lose virus, some RNA gets lost. That seems trivial. The problem in making an EQA panel that it is unpredictable and highly variable across viruses and stocks. We, had, we have seen differences, or Carlo, I should say, has seen differences in uh, RNA loss between one fold to 15 fold. So you cannot just put one concentration for every virus in your panel and say, this is the way we proceed because in some, you will have dramatic variation in the RNA concentrations you have in the final panel you use to ship to the, to the laboratories. And then of course you have to send material that will not cause harm to the recipient. So you have to ensure it's inactivated. How do you do that? You can radiate it by applying 20 kilograms, but then you need a radiation source. It's expensive. You need a certificate that's not easy to get or use heat inactivation. Then if you use heat inactivation and do then maybe three blind passages to ensure there's no viral growth, then what temperature do you use to inactivate? If you go to very high temperatures, you destroy the virus. If you go to too low temperatures, you may not fully inactivate. So again, it's not trivial. And this is my final slide and I congratulate the society and a previous speaker for a previous talk given on EQA, this was given um, in March 21 from Marguerite Loembe on African EQA programs. Congratulations for this. What I want to highlight in uh, and what we always try to do is we need transnational efforts for EQAs because we want to ensure comparability of results between countries and between laboratories of different countries. And of course, it's much more cost efficient if we to have this organized centrally, for example, ideally by the society hosting today's session. And it leads to consequences. And EQA is only good if there is a consequence to it so that the lab can question their workflow and improve. And if necessary, train. The problem is that in many African settings, in my experience, some of the not reference labs, I would, include, I would really make a differentiation between labs that work and that provide an important service to public health 
of their countries, but they're not reference lab and they're poorly trained, they're poorly equipped in many settings and the reference labs that usually have those problems to a lesser degree. What we need to have here in, in an African setting, and this may be provocative, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to, to hear your thoughts, is both EQA programs transnationally and training programs. As they, and I know there are some in place, but we need much more of it to be able to ensure the quality of diagnostics provided to the populations on the continent. And with that, I would like to finish. And I have many people to thank. This is a picture of my, my laboratory in happier days before the pandemic playing beach volleyball, those are their names. This is Carlo, you may soon see him if he goes online, if you have a question to technical details, which he will reply. And then many, many collaborators, which I won't spell out so that we have more time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Drexler. A very informative presentation. Colleagues will agree with me. Key to note among many things are the possibility of cross reactivity from immune reactions given uh, malaria infection and other viral uh, diseases. Then key considerations including tube selection, simple things like tube selection that can actually drive the cost of your production, but also the quality of your, your panels that you have to characterize going forward. And then the fact that in, in encouraging transnational EQAs are, are so key. Now we get to the questions and answer sessions and please keep the questions coming. Uh, I will ask my colleagues from the translation services wing to also look at questions that may be in French uh, so that they are dealt with as well. I'll start with uh, some of the questions in no order of preference. The first question is coming from Ruth. And Ruth is, it's actually not a question, but a comment. He's saying that he's interested in packaging, safe uh, shipment of samples to labs and then ultimate safe disposal. So the question to this that I am coining is, if you are a scheme provider pushing out materials, you know the content and how they should be disposed. Do you have responsibility in handling the waste or supporting the recipient labs to handle waste? Professor Drexler. Um, the, the, you mean the the, the, the the waste of the of the viruses that are shipped out? Um, that is that is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to provide a certificate of non-infectivity. So we have to give. Uh, we have to make sure that we are not that what we ship is not a biological risk to anybody, and that includes the lab people. It also includes the customs people and the courier people. Imagine we ship out infectious virus in a package, say for some car accident on the way, be it in Germany or be it in a receiving country in say, say Ethiopia bursts, the package bursts and then the, the parcel driver gets infected and then who is to blame? And then also, of course, we have to be sure that we are, that we are absolutely, absolutely certain that the, what we have there is not infectious anymore. This is why we, invest so much time and money and energy in making sure it's inactivated. Um, and our, but our responsibility ends there. Remember, this is an EQA has to be handled by the receiving lab as if it was a patient specimen. Otherwise it doesn't tell anything if, I mean, of course, I mean, we are all not ignorant. The lab people that handle the EQA will put some extra care on this because it's an EQA, they want to perform well. But the idea is treat this as if this was a regular patient specimen. Use exactly the same workflow because if you don't do that, you cannot improve. And your workflow will include, will include, of course it will, waste management. So this is a patient specimen at the end of the day in your routine and you have to take care of it as the receiving lab. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question is coming from from a lady Asmare, and she's asking, because of the possible interaction between malaria and some of the viral test kits out there, 
What would be your suggestion for testing an EQA performance in malaria countries that are conducting some of these tests, malaria endemic countries? And to add to that, would some of your analysis for labs that are participating outside Europe, would it include trying to compare false positivities among malaria endemic countries relative to their counterparts who do not have malaria endemicity? Over to you, Professor. Um, so first, a recommendation. I mean, I, I think this is of utmost importance and it's, it's, it's still a neglected topic, even if we are two years down the pandemic. I have, we have just recently looked at this. There is about 80 zero, zero, zero service, serological service from African countries that we have easily found in the literature, in the published literature or preprints, whatever. And worryingly, not a single one of them has systematically employed confirmatory testing for all we saw. Um, even if I miss one or two services here for which I apologize to the colleagues, the overall picture stays the same. We have to request a proper testing algorithm for antibody testing for COVID. Absolutely, in Africa, absolutely. And in Asia, in any malaria endemic region actually, and in, large, and in some parts of Southern America. It replies to all the tropics. Um, but of course, Africa is the global hotspot for malaria. Oh, you know that better than me. So it, this is a shout to validate serological surveys. Don't trust a simple ELISA result. It will be shameful potentially for you. Even if you get it published half a year later, it can be a, a dark spot in your CV and your publication list. I really recommend to take this extremely seriously and the ways to the ideal way to, to corroborate robustness of serological testing is to make a neutralization test. But here we come back to the problem that you need a proper laboratory to do this. And it may depend on your ability to enrich because you need to grow the virus. You need to have a lot of virus to be able to do neutralization testing. So it's not a patient specimen. It will be, and you need the proper structure to be able to do this. Even if you know the technique, you need to have this, the laboratory and the permission of your countries to do this. And it's not easy. If you don't have access to neutralization testing, I recommend mixing tests and algorithms. For example, if you use an ELISA as a screening assay, use a different S, maybe a CLIA or an ECLIA, so another system, maybe another antigen as a confirmatory test. Maybe you can use screening against a spike antigen and then you confirm against a nucleocapsic antigen. It of course comes at a cost. Not all antibodies behave comparably. Uh, we know that nucleocapsid antigens are lost more rapidly than spike uh, antibodies, so you may underestimate serum prevalence ultimately. I won't go into details here of serology, but I, I think the general message is here, um, request from anybody approaching you uh, with uh, antibody data, request confirmatory testing. There has to be an algorithm in place, especially for African countries. This is my first reply. Uh, and then Francis, to your question on, on sending this. I mean, if we do an EQA, we haven't done this in malaria endemic settings. We haven't done an EQA in, uh, for an African setting yet. If I were to do this, and if, it were, and, and if it was an antibody EQA, I think this is what we would have to aim for. We would have to, uh, so I agree with your approach. We would compare results between endemic, malaria endemic and non-endemic countries. Um, and then depending on the results, we could engage in a follow-up discussion with the, with the endemic countries on the reasons for this, the magnitude of the problem in function of the method they are using. But that's, that's like the, the, the follow-up of the EQA program, because the EQA in first is to show the problem and to give a feedback to the labs. So improving it is the second part of it, where you give feedback and depending on the abilities, if you have a large funding for this, you can then engage in a very individual follow-up and share between both the provider of the QA and the country. And also what I would then urge to do, remember I'm not a commercial provider, I'm a scientist like most people in today's session, is to engage between the countries. For example, it's, uh, it's of course, it would, I, I would feel it's a waste of time and efforts if we were to have the same discussion with every given country from Sub-Saharan Africa and they all are malaria endemic. So ideally, again, I would give the, the key role back to you, to Francis and colleagues at the African Society to take a lead in this. Nobody knows the countries better than you. 
you have the network, you have the knowledge, you have the persons. There has to be a transnational, transdisciplinary and transnational platform to discuss this. And this can base on a first situation so that we all know why we should take this seriously. But this is something that is best located in a central African setting in my opinion. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my next question coming through, and I will then hand it over to the, the translators to deal with a few French questions before I take it on again. But before we do that, my next question is, you demonstrated the, the, the need to have a BSL-3 laboratory when, when handling viral cultures, characterizing your panels and, and, and handling those, those preliminary aspects of, of EQA. We also know that there are labs or providers that are actually handling primary samples and using primary samples for EQA. What is your comment on that in terms of quality, but also the cost in, in both situations? It, 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 it can be used. I'm absolutely not against this. Usually it depends on the, on the availability of a specimen. If there is a lot of specimen so that we can ensure quality, and quantity, I think this can be done. It comes with a bit of additional risk because we don't exactly know what is in that specimen. Of course, one could now say, okay, I just do high throughput sequencing on a specimen to, to know what I'm sending out. This can be done. For, the, for me, it's just easier to grow virus and have a defined background. It's just much easier and it can be grown as high, in high concentration, which helps us to allow reproducibility because we have it in a stock. And we can always say, send, use the same virus again for shipping out. And in patient derived specimens, this of course will not always be possible. You will have to have one specimen. If you have a lot of participating labs, you need a lot of tubes. So you need to dilute the specimen. And eventually this may endanger reproducibility of what you, what you send around. But having said this, um, it's an absolutely acceptable um, circumvention of the problem of not having a BSL-3. Over. Thank you very much, Prof. Let me hand you over to Sarah. Sarah, please, one or two questions in French. Okay. I'll, I'll. Okay. Okay. Um, did you, Francis, did you hear the questions? I didn't hear anything. I guess, Prof, you can just take the question and help us with the, with the translation and then respond to it. Because Sarah is in a different channel. Doing that, yes. Okay, so just whoever has a question, just say it out loud. If you wish. Tesla, are you speaking? We can't hear you. You might be muted. Yes, we are. Yes. I'm not hearing anything. If let me see if you have it. it. Friends, do you think it's in the chat? But I don't know which is the question. Francis, why don't you take another question whilst we bring you the translation? Okay, so he, he speaks he, he speaks French as well, and so he should be getting you. Uh, I speak French. Just put your if you want if you have a question in French, say it out loud. I will reply in English. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's not a, a problem. Just go ahead with the question. Okay, so I can take the next questions uh, as we sort out the interpretation bit, and some of these are very interesting comments. Not necessarily questions. I will take one from uh, Sylvester. 
Sylvester is saying that the cost and availability of EQA to cover all tests provided in a laboratory can be phenomenal. And it is really a challenge and this needs to be addressed. You can comment on that comment, Professor. I, I agree. The, the cost of making an EQA also is a challenge for us. Uh, so it's, the cost is, exists on the receiving side and on the producing side. Uh, we need to motivate funders to, to, to fund science, to promote science, so that we are able to, uh, to provide EQA panels free of charge. Because uh, the cost is at the commercial side. And people are enforced to buy EQA panels from companies. And um, I see this, per I personally, I understand that some companies are different, are better than others. But in general, I think we are in a pandemic and we are in a resource limited setting today. We are discussing this in African settings. And I'm, I'm, I'm much against uh, uh, Im imposing hundreds of thousands of euros or dollars on a lab in a resource limited setting to receive EQA panels from a commercial provider. What we need is funders, science funders to promote this so that we can do it ourselves. It's not rocket science. There's never a big super paper. There's, there will not be a science paper easily from an EQA program, um, but it's something that we know we can do to contribute to, to the service we provide to the communities. And uh, I think this is, this is an important thing. And maybe as a small detail, if you are a provider, it's important not to overflow the labs. So in a lab network, you, it's important not to send out something every month. You know, if you go to the labs and say, expert lab X in country Y, here's an EQA panel and next month the next, and then for another pathogen and another, because this will ultimately also, even if you don't pay for the panels, it will be a burden to the lab. So one has to balance this a bit and be reasonable. But the key question here is not to depend on commercial suppliers that receive their pathogens from the scientific community in the first place, in many cases, from us. For free. Okay, uh, one more question coming in. And the question is, in, in the running of your EQA, scheme, we know that you're not a commercial provider, but do you pick out pre-analytical information around the testing that then happens, other than just the results that are shipped to you? Yes, I agree. Um, this is really of utmost importance to interpret the results to, uh, to and also to correlate the, the performance with a given instrument, test, and even setting. Um, we've, we've done that repeatedly. Um, uh, we have compared, for example, Carlo has done this, and Carlo, feel free to hop in anytime you wish. Um, comparing, for example, manual extraction and automated extraction. And it, may, it all makes a difference, of course. The type of test, uh, the type of, perform, of lab workflow you have can differ. Uh, in the first EQA, we tried to compare the, to analyze the performance of a given laboratory in function of the wealth of a given country. And we were hoping to, to, to have a, a look at whether poor, say, country laboratories in poorer countries with probably more limited structure were, were, having, were encountering more difficulties than those from, say, Germany or France or England, so the rich countries of Western Europe. And it was not very much the case, Carlo. Do you want to comment on, on that analysis, if you're online? Yes. Um, so I think the, the most important message from all this analysis of like methods and also on the wealth of the countries is usually there's not one perfect method. And I guess the consequence is that training of the laboratory people is the most important part. So you cannot say me method A is the best and provides the best results, but it's training of the people because usually we don't have a very clear picture. Sometimes automated extraction is a bit superior, but in general, it's not the method or the test itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. My, my next question, and you can hold there and probably support Professor, he needs to take some break. Uh, the next question is coming from Dean. 
And, and, and Dean is asking, in the SARS-CoV-2 EQA program, was there any co correlation between incorrect results and specific instruments or assays? The assay methods that are being used. I mean, that's basically what I wanted to say before. I mean, we did test, so we asked participants for a lot of information saying which extraction kit they used, which test they run, the target of the test, um, the extraction volumes, all this was requested and of course analyzed by us. And like mostly there is no clear correlation between all those different steps. For example, what we expected to see always was to see laboratories perform better that use more sample volume and extract or elute the RNA in a smaller volume. So doing an up concentration. But in fact, we didn't see this because probably the technical details is less important than the proper handling of the laboratory people. I hope that answers the yeah. question. It does, thank you very much, Carl. Now, the next question that I'll direct to Professor Drexler is, and then I'll take the French question. I, I have a translation now. So Professor, how can EQA be adapted in resource limited countries like Liberia, especially where the laboratory contributes to the service delivery of clients? And this is coming from Emmanuel. But to add to that question, we also do know that countries and regions are struggling to have uh, providers, small providers, multiple providers within the same, same country, within the same region. What is your comment on having multiple providers of an EQA scheme in the same location? Um, yeah, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a big fan of, 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 of ac ac academia-driven EQAs. I think ideally we should do this ourselves. To take a lead on this, um, as said, this is not e this is easily said, but not easily done. It's what I think we, as a, as 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 the expert, should engage in. Um, it's uh, it's difficult to say to to use different providers of different quality. I think it will vary a lot between countries. In some countries, for example, you may need those certificates from a given provider to show to your ministry if you are a state lab that you are able to do proper testing, to be allowed to keep testing. Maybe in a given setting, a given laboratory has to say, do this to ensure that payment of staff in the pandemic is granted by a given public institution like a Ministry of Health. And we know that the ministries have diverted funds from routine work and they have increased the funds of the laboratories. So in those settings, I don't think one is to blame a lab if they do everything to show good performance to their superiors to ensure their, their funding without which they couldn't afford the staff doing all this extra work, which I showed, which I started with. Um, it's a huge challenge to all of the countries, especially in the, in the, um, in the, um, in the uh, resource limited settings. So this is not easy. And then second, in a set, in a resource limited setting like uh, Liberia, I think was mentioned by Francis, uh, one, has to, one has to make it as easy as possible for the colleagues. It's, it's the, it starts with what do you ship out? What is the most prominent question that this, those countries have to, have, to, have to reply to? For example, when we send out the second EQA when, uh, that Carlo prepared for both detection and typing, it was not obligatory to do the typing to get a certificate. If you just do the detection, because this is where it starts with patient diagnostics, are you or are you not infected with the coronavirus? Then you already got a participant of participation. I think I will, I will have, if you allow me Francis, before we go to the French question, one more detail, I want to share an anecdote here that comes to my mind now, uh, confidentiality of results. If you are an EQA provider, uh, you have to deal with the lab performance individually on a bilateral basis. None of the other countries or labs and can be informed about a given lab's performance. Remember, I showed you in the Brazilian Zika example that some of the labs performed poorly. 
they had false positives, which is real, no, it's, it's really dramatic. It shouldn't have happened, but it did happen substantially. And I later got, so first the public author, the authorities, the Ministry of Health completely ignored it. It was a scientific study. We published it and they didn't care. The ministry people didn't care. It's not their business to read scientific papers. So nobody cared. Then uh, the largest Brazilian newspaper reported on our study. Suddenly people started caring and, and we got approached by stakeholders, ministry, ministry of health to reveal the performance of, of 15 laboratories. They were all from Brazil. And, uh, and, I, and I refused to do this. It's, I cannot do this because if you break trust with the lab that if you perform badly, I will, I will feedback to you so that you can improve if you manage. But of course, if I, because otherwise, who will participate in an EQA program if you have to fear that you are, will be punished for it? So there has to, there's a fine balance of how you deal with this and uh, confidentiality and trust is vital. Not in your country, if you have more than one lab from a country, it's not the business of any lab, in a, even in a given country, to know how well another lab was performing. If the lab heads are friends or colleagues and they share the experiences, perfect, it's their business. It's not our business as providers to mingle with it. So I think this is an important note that I forgot to include in my presentation. Thank you very much, and that, that's really key. Now, the, the, the French questions, I'm reading this verbatim. And so the, the, the first question from the same uh, person asking is that being an EQA panel supplier, are you accredited? you that that may not necessarily relate but you can answer that then what is the range of eqa you offer for which test procedures or methods and then the third is what are the requirements if Burkina Faso, for example would like to participate in your, your eqa program and then lastly what are the costs and frequencies of your your test events i hope you can remember the four quick questions yeah, I don't, I'm not, my reply is short because we are not a, com remember, we are not a commercial EQA provider. We do this when we have a project. We, we, we propose a scientific project to a funder. In the SARS case, it was the, uh, the, the ECDC. And if they fund it, we can do it. But there is not, we don't have a homepage. You cannot just order our products. We have no program for Africa. We cannot, for you, for, the, for today's audience, we have almost nothing to offer. It's still a good question because what we want to do uh, very soon is we want to put our panels and uh, we, we have so we will try to do some more EQA panels and we'll put them online free of charge in, in, a, in a European project which is called EVA, the European Virus Archive. So what we want to do is we want to put the panels online but it won't be an EQA program. We will we'll be able to click on this and maybe I can, Carlo, let's remember to share the link with the African society so that they can share it among their members. Uh, because then you can just get our panel free of charge. You will have to pay for shipment, uh, but you will have to deal with it individually. We, can, we, will un, we will unblind it for the laboratory head and you will have to deal with it. Uh, but we will at least take care of the, for, to some extent with the production in that European project. We wanted to have that ready already, but we were not able to do so yet. Um, so there is no cost in participating. I would I refer you to the homepage of the EU-funded EBD LabNet program that is headed by Chantal Roeskin from the Dutch Public Health in, uh, Institute, the RIVM, and they provide EQA panels for viruses very, very regularly to European reference labs. They have EQAs on serology of rodent-borne pathogens, of uh, arboviruses, hemorrhagic fevers, so they, they cover all different ranges of viruses. Um, it's a, they have a very broad portfolio and, uh, and it's a co consortium of all the European reference labs. So it, it's very broad. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Drexler. We are at exactly the top of the hour. It has been exhaustive, informative, and, and I think that uh, participants today with us have enjoyed the sessions. We will put the materials on our online resource center 
and, and questions that have not been answered, we will share them with Professor and his team so that we can have those answers and that too will be posted on our resource center. Just before I close, your closing remarks, Professor Jean Felix Drexler. My closing remark in brief is thank you for your attention. Thanks to, again to the Society for hosting this. I, uh, I, I much appreciate the efforts of Africa CDC and the African Society of Laboratory Medicine to, to improve the level of care uh, 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 for communicable diseases and their diagnosis in an African setting. It's not an easy task and we are very happy to be able to contribute, for example, with today's session and uh, keep up the good work. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you too. And um, with this, we come to the end of our session for today. Till our next session, goodbye from me to all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>